Good morning. Oh, that was great. I'll stay out there y'all again. Y'all are excited to be here. I'm excited to be here for the first time. It's a, that's a rare thing, isn't it, right now that the new pastor is here for the first time that we're gathering together. I'm, I'm a visitor. I'm a, guest, I'm a guest here today. But I'm excited to be here. Before we get started, um, I want to say this, that, you know, I want to say thank you to all who contributed over the last, I don't know, two, two and a half, three months into making this church just go during this pandemic. Um, I mean, there's so many people. I don't want to. I don't list anybody because I don't want to miss some miss anybody. But if we could, can we give a ha- just a hand for those who who just kept this place going? It was a it's a big deal. It's unprecedented time. And I, one thing that I was just so impressed with um, from the outside looking was that, that this church just kept going despite everything, despite the pandemic. And so, um, very thankful to all who played a role into that. Um, and so, just a few announcements today. A few announcements today as we dismiss. Remember this, that when we leave today, um, we're going to exit out that door. Okay, we're going to exit out that door, and then I will greet you on the breezeway. We're trying to keep the flow of traffic all going one direction. And, and probably what will happen, or what will happen, is um, Mr. Ken Jones, he'll do the benediction, and then he'll pray, and then he'll probably dismiss us by section. Right, so he'll, probably, he'll he'll dismiss the balcony, and then the left, and then the right, or vice versa, however he decides. I'll leave that up to him. But we'll dismiss by section. That we're not bottlenecking at the door, and we're able to social distance things like that. Also, when we dismiss, um, if you notice, there's a little black box over here. That's where you can slide your offering as you leave. You can put it right there. Um, that avoids us from passing the plate and, and sharing our germs. Right, so we can slide that in right there. That's today. Tomorrow, um, there will be a nominating meeting at seven o'clock. Um, and then don't forget Zoom Bible study on Wednesday nights at 7. Um, we send that out an email. If you're not being a part of that, we would love for you to join in that. And then don't forget to turn in all deacon nomination ballots. You should have been mailed a deacon nomination ballot. Make sure you turn that in. Make sure you mail that back to the church by Friday. I think the deadline for that is Friday, so make sure you do that. Okay? Listen, um, today I'm excited to be here. I'm excited you're here. And... I pray that we will have a good day just worshiping the Lord. So excited you're here. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, and Lord, we're thankful for who you are. And I pray that right now as we we transition into just a time of worship and a time of where we are reflecting on who you are and reflecting on why we're here, Lord, I pray that you will move in a mighty way. For those who are not here with us and who are at home and who are going to watch this later today, Lord, I pray that you would speak to them. Lord, that you would speak to them through the screen, Lord, that you would move in a mighty way through their homes. Lord, you have been so good to us during this season, Lord, and I, I just pray, Lord, that we would that we would not forget your goodness. We would, not, we would not forget how good you are to us. And today, as we worship, as we hear the word read, as we hear songs sung, and as we hear your word proclaimed, Lord, I just pray that we would glorify you. And Lord, I pray that in all that we do, that we would that we would bring glory to you, and that when we leave this place, we would take the words that we've heard, and we would use them. That we would not just be hearers, but we would be doers also. So we love you, and we praise you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Today I will be reading from James 1, verse 5. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach and it will be given to him. Let us pray. Dear God, I just want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for letting us come together. And Lord, I want to thank you for you giving us wisdom when we ask. And Lord, I pray that everyone in this sanctuary and everyone at home tries to seek your face and just spend some time in your presence during this time. God, we love you. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Be thou my 
try not to be cry positive, but we all know that that's how we are around here. Just to stand up here and see you. It's been hard to sing in this empty room, and we've worked really hard to bring you music, small groups and different groups. And of course, I was thinking about Pam this morning when we were singing as, as a ladies' ensemble, but to see you all here means a lot. Um, some of us were here last week, and Aaron said it was really good to preach to a room that had bodies in it, but to sing with all your... This came out of nowhere, I'm sorry. But we've missed you, and we've missed having our body here. So thank you for the support and your encouraging words of support for those of us that have continued to try to sing and, and do the worship service and Donna pulling together sermons and, and group talks and things like that. It's meant a lot. And I got you, Beth, didn't I? Beth's back here. Brian Hunter, Beth. But it's a blessing to us. And it'll be a blessing to Aaron to have more bodies in the sanctuary today. And we have felt your presence, but to see you here today just, just means a lot. Sorry. Here you are. Let's pray. Let's pray. Well, we love you, and we're thankful for who you are. And we're thankful, Lord, for this day you've given us, a day that we can gather. I feel like at times, maybe before this pandemic, that we, we might have taken that for granted. But, Lord, I don't think we do now. And, Lord, I, I'm thankful for the opportunity that we get to come together as a body of believers and to sing and to hear your word read and to hear it proclaimed. And, Lord, and hopefully, Lord, that we would bring you glory in all that we do today. And, Lord, I pray, as, as I said earlier, that, that when we leave this place, that the word that you've given, that we would not just hear it, but we would do it also. Lord, we love you. And we praise you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, we will be in verses 13 through 18. That's where we're going to spend the majority of our time. James 3, 13 through 18. While you're turning there, I just want to remind us we're in the middle of a, of a series where we were talking about um, where we're praying and fasting, right? We're praying every day at 1219. We're fasting on Wednesdays, and we're, we're not doing that just aimlessly. We're doing that for a specific purpose, right? We're praying for certain attributes. Last week, we talked about praying for unity, right? We talked about what unity is, and we said that we talked about unity being, um, first and foremost, comes through a relationship with Jesus and the gospel, right? But then also that impacts our relationship with others. And then when, as believers, we have unity in the mission that we're on and the mission that we were to tell others of the gospel to go and make disciples. And then also, that we are united as believers in our destination, that where we end up, right? That we, the new heaven and the new earth, that what we experience here on this earth um, in the unity that we can have here is only a taste of what's to come in the new heaven and the new earth. This Sunday, we are looking at wisdom. We're looking at wisdom and that we need to be praying for wisdom. Last Saturday, or well, every Saturday, I take Thatcher, my eight-month-old, to go see his parents, to see his grandparents. And so... We, that's what we've done kind of in this pandemic. Thatcher's kind of stayed holed up in the house, um, except for on Saturday and Sunday. Saturday he goes sees my parents, and on Sunday he goes sees Emily's parents. And so that's kind of how we've, we've kept the grandparents at bay um, <laughs> by, by taking them in. And so that's what we do then. And so on my way to Beulahville, I went past the park here in town, and I noticed that they were playing a softball tournament. And I was, I, and when I saw it, I was like, oh, they're playing a softball tournament. It felt normal again. Like, it felt there was some normalcy that came with that. And, you know, this week I was flipping through the Duplin Times, and there was an article about the softball tournament and how there was some people were upset about people gathering and not using social distancing guidelines and all these different things. And whoever is over the, the park had, had said, you know what, we, we made a mistake. We should have done things a little differently. We should have done things here. And they pretty much said, we're going to try to do better going forward. At the end of the article, that's kind of what the conclusion has come to. And I continue to flip through the Duplin Times, and almost every article read something to that effect. Either we're in the middle of this situation and we don't know what to do, or we've done something and we've made a mistake and we're trying to learn from it. All the articles said this. All the articles were speaking to the fact of we need wisdom. We don't know what we're doing right now in this time. That right now is unprecedented and we're really not sure how to move forward. And the ones that have moved forward have realized we probably should have waited a little bit or we probably should have done things differently, right? And so 
I feel like this is the case not just for the Duplin Times or for Kingsville, for Duplin County. This is the case everywhere. Everywhere right now is trying to figure out what do we do next? Where do we go? What does this look like? Because this pandemic has changed things. The racial tension that's happened over the last few weeks is changing things, and people are trying to figure out how to live and exist in this world. And we need to be praying for wisdom. We need to be praying for wisdom because if we're really honest, if we're honest with ourselves, we don't know what to do next. And even our leaders, I think if they're honest, they would admit that they don't know what to do either, and they're just trying to do the best they can with the numbers that they have and trying to figure out what's best. We need wisdom, and this is why we're praying for it. As your pastor of this church, we need wisdom. This is unprecedented. I don't know of anyone who's been picked to be a pastor of a church in the middle of a pandemic, right? And then for it to be your first church in the middle of a pandemic. This is unprecedented, right? I need your wisdom. This church, we need wisdom to understand how we move forward. And so this is what we're praying for. This is why we're talking about it today. Our goal today is to define wisdom, to define it, and to determine how we can then walk in it. So James 3, 13 through 18, what we need to know going into it. James, the author of this, obviously, is the half-brother of Jesus. That's a really important thing to note. James also wasn't a believer of Jesus until he was resurrected. And, you know, I don't really blame him. Could you imagine your older brother coming to you and say, Hey, I'm the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and I'm going to save everybody. If my younger brother would come to me, I would probably tackle him and say, Get over yourself, dude. Right? Because what a, what a thing to say. But when Jesus resurrected from the grave, when he was dead, but then came alive, that changed things, right? It made a difference. And so not only does James then become a believer, we also see in Acts that he becomes a leader of the Jerusalem church. It's at the Jerusalem council where we see that James is the one who makes the decision that says, don't make it hard for the Gentiles. Don't make it harder for them to become believers. He's the one that says that. So James is a very influential member of the early church. We also need to understand who this letter is written to. This letter is written to persecuted Christians in Jerusalem. So after the stoning and, and martyr of Stephen, the Christians in Jerusalem left. They flee because they were scared for their life. And so this letter is written to those believers. And what's really important about this letter is that it's unique in that the first 18 verses act as a prologue. And they act as kind of an introduction to the whole letter. And they essentially summarize this whole letter. So to really understand what we're going to read today in 3, 13 through 18, we need to understand what's being said in verse 5, really through verse 8. And so, so we can understand, okay, this is what he said at the beginning, and then we're going to look at what does he say in greater detail in 3, 13 through 18. So let's first quickly look at 5 through 8. And he says this in verse 5, chapter 1. If any of you lacks wisdom... Let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wise wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So what we need to see in verse 5 is this, is that if you lack wisdom, then you should ask. And that God will give it to us generously. If you look at Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, I'll read it for us quickly. It says this, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your hearts to understanding, yes, you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding if you seek it like silver. And search for it as it is for hidden treasures. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives us wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Where does wisdom come from? Wisdom comes from God. It comes from the Lord. And we are to ask for it. But we're not only to ask for it, but we are to seek for it. And how do we seek for it? Seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures. We don't just seek for it like we lost, like we lost our keys, right? We're, we're seeking a treasure. We're seeking something that's valuable. We're seeking something that's going to give us gain, that's going to make us more valuable. This is how we should see and understand wisdom, right? And he's saying we should seek it. So this is why we are praying for it. 
This is why we are fasting for it. Because yes, we should ask and we should pray, but we also should be going after it, seeking it in the way we live our life. We should be fasting, saying we're going to give something up so we can say, Lord, I want this wisdom so bad that I'm willing to give this up on a Wednesday. Right? That we say that we're also seeking his word, that we are going to his word to find it for himself. Right? God wrote a book. His wisdom lies in, in his word, and that's where we should be seeking his wisdom. And so we need to seek it like silver. And then we get to verses 6 through 8. And what it says is that when we ask, we need to ask expecting it. We don't need to ask doubting that he's going to give it to us. We need to pray with some expectancy. We need to be trusting that God is going to give us what he promises. God is a good God. He gives us what he says he'll give us. And so we need to be praying that. We need to be expecting that. And he says that when we pray not expecting it, then we are a double-minded man like being tossed in the waves, that we are uncertain. He's telling us, ask and ask, expecting that it's going to be given to you. James 1, 5 through 8 points to our main text, which is James 3, 13 through 18. And what we see in that passage in 3, 13 through 18 is that James is comparing worldly wisdom to godly wisdom. He's going to make a comparison between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. So now let's read James 3, 13 through 18. And it says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What we see here in James chapter 3, verse through 13 through 18, is that wisdom is seen in action, pursued in holiness, and brings peace. In 13 through 18, in chapter 3, we see wisdom is seen in action, pursued in holiness, and it brings peace. So the first thing that we see is that wisdom is seen in action. If you draw your attention back to verse 13, he says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in meekness and wisdom. We know someone is wise by how they act, by their conduct, by the way that they live their life. This is not, this is not unique to this, this passage of Scripture. This is a very common theme in the whole book of James. If you look just a chapter back in verse 18, it says this, But someone will say, If you have faith and I have works, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. He makes the same case in point about faith, that if you want to see someone's faith, Look at their works. Look at how they live their life. The same point is being made here about wisdom. If you want to look at someone and know that they are wise, look at how they act. I know for a fact that I was a very unwise individual at about age 18. Here's how I know. Because at 18, I was, the, I was taking one class on campus. I was a senior, and I had several online classes. One of those online classes was an online PE class. Yes, online PE, online physical education. So they would tell me to go do something, and then I'm to do it, and then I'm to tell them that I did it online. Okay, that's what it consisted of. All right, now, um, I'll, I'll confess to you this, is that they didn't know that I didn't go and run the mile and check my heart rate. I just looked up what a healthy heart rate was, right? <laughs> they didn't know that, but here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. I couldn't figure out how to use the online platform. I couldn't figure out how to use Blackboard. And rather than ask, I just didn't. I didn't do anything. I just hung out with my friends, or I went home, and I played video games, and I just didn't do anything. And I didn't take the time to ask. I just didn't do anything. And so when it came for the proxy report to come out, and I had a big fat goose egg, my instructor, the online instructor who was there to help me, who I didn't ask, says, Aaron, you've got to drop. 
And let's hope that the professor lets you because if you don't drop, you're failing. And this is not only going to tank your GPA for your senior year, but it's going to tank your GPA going into college. And it, it still didn't dawn on me. Like, I, had, I got grounded for weeks because of this. My actions showed that I was very unwise. Not too many years later, I was in college, and I, me and my friends would go down to Deep Bottom, North Carolina. I don't know if you know where that's at, but at Deep Bottom, there's a river, and there's a bridge, and there's a rope swing, and it is a very, um, they say it's a very deep hole, but I could have swore I've touched the bottom of that hole a few times. And we would swing off this rope into this very dark and murky water. Like, it was so dark, you put your hand in it, and you no longer see your hand. It's, it's dark, and it's, it's, it's just not very, it's dark water. And I would go with my buddies, and every time I leave my house, my dad would say, you be careful. You be careful. There's no telling what's underneath that current. There's no telling what's going to happen to you. And I said, oh, we'll be fine. It's a lot of fun. There's a ton of people out there. Nothing's going to happen. And we would swing, and we would do all this stuff. And there was three different levels. There was like a low level, and then there was what they called the diagonal, which was a, a cypress tree that grew out of the bank, and you could roll off of it and swing. And then you would get some real good air off that. But then there was another one that we called at the highest level, and it was, it was a deer stand that someone had put into a tree, and you would climb up on that deer stand, and you would roll out of it, and, I mean, you, would, you could count to five before you hit the water. I mean, you would go high. And, you know, we would, we would spend hours out there in the summertime, and we would, when, in between swings, we would all sit around and talk about, you remember last year when such and such jumped off this thing, and he broke his leg? You remember last year when such and such did this and he, he, he didn't quite make it around the backflip and he got a concussion and spent a couple days in the hospital? Y'all remember a few years ago when that guy jumped off the bridge and he died? Y'all remember that? Yep, sure did. Who's going next? Like, <laughs> that, that was the conversation that we had at the river. And we would still do it. How unwise were we? And then a year or so later, they found out that there were alligators in that river that were coming out on that beach. And we were swimming in it and having a good old time. It wasn't very wise. And I know it wasn't very wise now because of my actions, because of the decisions that I was making. We know someone is wise by the decisions that they make and how they live their life. Our conduct must be above reproach. And that brings us to our second point, which is this. Wisdom is the pursuit of holiness. So if you look at 14 through 16, we see this. But if you have bitter jealousy... And selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. That is that this is not that wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. This is where we see that James is beginning to compare worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. And he's saying that worldly wisdom is seen in someone who is jealous. And has selfish ambition. Someone who is practicing worldly wisdom is only after themselves. They only want what they can get for themselves. David Platt says this. A wisdom in the world measures everything by how it affects you. It's concerned with how you can advance yourself, promote yourself, or assert yourself. James says that this is from the devil. That this is demonic. Now, this may sound, demonic may sound over the top, but I think what we'll see in 2 Thessalonians 9 and 10 says this, Then coming out of lawlessness, lawless, one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. When we act in worldly wisdom, what we are doing is opening ourselves up to become deceived. We're opening ourselves up to become deceived. We're opening ourselves to be deceived by the enemy, deceived by Satan. Worldly wisdom allows ourselves to become vulnerable to deception. We open ourselves up to, to allow small sins to exist in our life. We say small sins, right? These sins, that they, they don't matter. That as long as we do these small things, then... They won't really affect us. There's a, a documentary that came out on Netflix. You probably saw it went nuts during the beginning of the pandemic. It was called The Tiger King, right? And it was this guy who, who had these tigers, and he had this illegal kind of zoo-type thing. But what he would do is he would allow people to 
hold baby tigers and pet them, right? And they loved it. Like, people came from all over just to, to hold and pet a baby tiger because baby tigers are cute, right? They're fun, right? But if we were to own a baby tiger and we were to raise it as our own, and when it's young, it's cute, right? And, it, and it's fun to play with. But when a tiger grows and becomes full grown, a tiger is going to do what a tiger does. It's going to eat, right? And if it gets hungry enough, it doesn't care what it eats. It'll eat you, right? Sin is very similar in our own life. Sin may start small, and as long as we allow it to exist in our life, it'll grow. And it grows in our life, and then it's soon enough, sin is going to do what it does. And it'll destroy us. This is how the enemy works in, in our lives. This is what worldly wisdom does. It closes our minds off. It deceives us. And what it does is allow things to enter into our life that at first may seem insignificant and small. But then they grow. And over time, it changes us. And we may have done something at the beginning for good intentions, but before the end of it, we're, now we're, we have selfish ambition. We're only after ourselves. And this is, what, this is what James means when he says it's demonic, that it's unspiritual, that it's worldly. And this is what it does to us. Do not deal with the deception of small sins, for then we'll grow to sins, to bigger sins and destroy us. No kid in the third grade at career day says, you know, when I grow up, I want to be an alcoholic and an abuser. No one says that. No one in the third grade says they want to grow up and become this horrible individual or a drug addict or anything like that. No one says that. That's not an aspiration you have as a kid. But yet we see it over and over, don't we? How do we end up there? How does people get there? Because what happens is that small sins enter our life and we make decisions and they grow. And before we know it, what we think is wise is now not wise. And then someone is dependent. Now this is an extreme example, but if, if we're not we will do the same thing in our own lives. We allow these small things to creep in, and if we, don't, if we don't do something with them, they will destroy us. They will destroy us. When this happens to the believer, not, it destroys the truth. When it happens to, to those who say they're a Christian, not only does it destroy their life, but it destroys the lives of the people that are around them, that, that are believers with them. Right? It degrades the truth is what it says in James. It, change, it waters it down. When believers act, uh, act in this way, act in worldly wisdom, what then happens is this, is that they then will feed into the stereotype that all Christians are hypocrites. Isn't that what the world says about us? Is that we're hypocrites? Is that I'm not going to go to that church because they're a bunch of hypocrites. But when we allow worldly wisdom to become a part of our life and when we act on it and we become deceived by it, then we are fulfilling that stereotype and we become hypocritical. The only way we combat this is through pursuing holiness. Pursuing holiness. And holiness is the practice of setting ourselves apart. Right? God, the Bible says that God is holy. God is holy because he is set apart. He is different than anything else. He, he is a being that is, knows all things, is everywhere at one time. He is infinitely wise. He's set apart. We are fundamentally different than him in every way because he's God. Now, for us to practice holiness is then to set ourselves apart. Our orthodoxy should be seen in our orthopraxy. That simply means this, is that what we believe about God should determine how we live. What we believe about him should determine how we live. If we say, our, if we, say we are a Christian, then we need to act like we're a Christian. We need to act like we believe the gospel. And this is the main theme of really James's whole letter. If you look at James 2, 14 through 17, it says this. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. 
Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. We cannot separate faith apart from works. These two things work together. Now, we need to be clear. We need to get the order right. It's not works, then faith. You can't work your way to gaining faith. Ephesians 2 is clear about that. But we have to understand that if we have believed the gospel, if we have faith, then we will work. We will show that we're... He gives the example here. If someone comes to you and says, hey, I'm hungry, I'm cold, I need something. How cruel would it be to say, Jesus loves you. Go on your way. That's cruel. To not take care of their needs, but just to give them the gospel. No, we should give them the gospel and give them a coat and a bowl of soup. We should do both. We have to understand that our faith and our works has to come together. That if we are a Christian, then we must act like we are a Christian. That our orthodoxy must be seen in our orthopraxy. That what we believe should then tell us how we live. And this is what sets us apart. This is how we pursue holiness. This is how we become that. Because we should then begin to look different than the culture that is around us. We should not then be walking in worldly wisdom. But we should then be walking in godly wisdom. You see, pursuing holiness is to grow in wisdom. And the third point is this, is that wisdom brings peace. Wisdom brings peace. If you look at the last two verses in 17 and 18, it says this. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Wisdom brings peace. Wisdom is from God. That is the first thing we need to point out here in these last few verses. We said it already when we looked in verse 5, but we need to understand this. We need to make this very clear that wisdom comes from God. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 and 7, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. Let's read that again. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. The thing about worldly wisdom is that it goes away, is that it fades, is that it may last for a little while, but then it goes away. Do you know how many books there are about church structure? And the way a church should be set up. You know how many books there are out there about business practices? And this is good business practices. This is the way a business should be set up. And what happens is that these same practices, they just come back again. They go away and they come back. They go away and they come back. Because at the end of the day, those things may be good practices. and may be helpful. But at the end of the day, they're created by man. And they're going to go and come. But what we need to understand is that godly wisdom does not go and come. That it has always existed. Because he has always existed. And he will always exist. Because here's the thing. Wisdom is built in time. Time comes with wisdom. I can now, 10 years later, look back at my 18-year-old self and say how unwise it was to not to ask a question on how to use it. Because time has changed me. Time has made me more wise. Imagine someone who has always existed and how wise that person is. That's who God is. That's why he has the ability to be infinitely wisdom because he has always existed and he always will. Time is in his hands. He created it. He is infinite because he created the ability to be infinite. He is time. And so he has all the wisdom because he's always existed. And the worldly wisdom that's in our world today It's going to fade. It may come back, but it's going to fade again. But godly wisdom is here to stay. And that's who we need to understand who our wisdom comes from. It also says here in in verse 17, it says this. It lists a list of attributes. But I think it's really important to note. But the wisdom from above is first pure. It says before anything else is pure. Pure means this. Pure is not mixed or, or 
adultery with any other substance or material. James is reiterating, reiterating what he already said in verses 14 through 16. That holiness, that wisdom lies in holiness, the pursuit of holiness where we find that our lives should look like we don't have any sin in it. Now, will we sin? Yes. But we should be above reproach. That from the outside, people should see sin in our life. That we should be so above reproach. That we should be living our life in such a way that people don't see the mistakes in our life. And when they do see them, we should be quick to repent. I don't know if you met someone like that, but there's people, I've met people in my life that I didn't know if they sinned or not. My granddaddy was that way. My dad's dad, I never saw him mess up. I didn't know if he was, if he ever did anything wrong because he lived above reproach. Now, I know he was a sinner because he was human. Emily says all the time, if you've got skin, then you've got sin. If you've got skin, you've got sin because that's true. All humans have sin. But if we're believers, we should live in such a way that it appears as if we don't, that we don't. And this is what we're being called to here. This is what James says. First and foremost, wisdom is being pure, being without sin. But then he lists other attributes. That holiness then leads to peaceable, living in a life without conflict, gentle, open to reason, merciful, impartial, and sincere. I don't know about you, but when I read that, that list this week, I saw about three or four that I definitely do not hit the mark. I do not hit the mark. And if we're honest, we don't hit the mark here. We don't measure up here. There's room to grow here. But what James is painting here is that we are to be wise, and this is what it looks like. It looks to be pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, mercy, impartial, and sincere. This is what wisdom looks like. This is how we move forward in it. So if you want to know how to be wise, here's your list. Here's your to-do list. Here's how we move forward in it. These are the things we're striving for. These are the things that we're praying for. This is the picture, James points, of godly wisdom. This is wisdom. This wisdom also produces something. If we see at the very end in verse 18, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This godly wisdom produces peace and righteousness because if we're living with holiness, if we're pursuing holiness, and our life begins to look different, and then because our life looks different, people then begin to take notice. And now the peace that we have in our life is now being seen by other people, and now they are saying, I want what he's got. He's got peace. There's something different about this. He's responded differently to this pandemic. She's responded differently to the racial tension in our country. What's the difference? The peace of Jesus. The wisdom of God, that's what sets us apart. It's what makes us different. But it comes by living in the way that is set for us. It comes through pursuing holiness. Peaceful living point people to the peace of Jesus. Peaceful living points people to the peace of Jesus. This passage lays out what we should be praying for right now. This passage lays out what we should be praying for right now. Jesus says that, James says that wisdom is seen in our lives by our conduct. Godly wisdom is the pursuit of holiness, and the outcome of that holiness is peace and righteousness. If we are to walk in the wisdom of God, then we are to pursue holiness. It is in that pursuit that we will find peace. In that peace, we will show others the peace that only comes through a relationship with Jesus. Wisdom is the pursuit of Jesus while the world pursues its own gain. While the world is out chasing whatever it is that it's chasing. Going after the ways of this world, chasing after a wind is what Solomon would say in Ecclesiastes. Something that they can never obtain. We believers should pursuing holiness. We should be reaching after Jesus, the one who is truly holy. I'll conclude this way. J.C. Ryle has this quote. We must be holy because this is one grand end and purpose for which Christ came into the world. Jesus is a complete Savior. He does not merely take away guilt of a believer's sin. He does, not, he does more 
he breaks its power. Jesus just didn't die so that you would be free from your sins in that moment. He gives us the ability to walk and live in such a way that we don't have to give into it anymore. He breaks the power of sin in our life. This is what we're talking about next week when we talk about gospel growth, that the gospel, what we believe about Jesus, that his life, death, and resurrection, that truth is not just for the moment that you said yes to him, but it's for the moments after it so you can live in it and so you can grow in it. J.D. Greer, past our, the, the Southern Baptist president, says this point all the time in the sermon. He says, the gospel isn't the diving board. It's the pool. It's what we dive into. It's what we exist in. It's what we swim in. It's what we play in. It's what makes up our life. And to belittle it is something that just saves us. It do, does it a disservice. The gospel does far more than that. It breaks the power of sin. As we continue to pray for wisdom, be praying this, that we will pursue holiness. As individuals, but also as a church, that each of us, that in our lives, that we will pursue holiness, that we will pursue Jesus, that we will do that through relationships with, with him, reading our Bible, praying and fasting, making that a part of our daily lives. But also, holiness is, is integrity. Holiness is doing the right thing when no one's watching us. That's holiness. We need to be pursuing that as individuals, our wisdom, but also we need to understand that we need to be praying that wisdom would promote peace. Wisdom would promote peace. I cannot think of a more fitting thing to be praying for right now. We need to be praying that the wisdom that would come to this church and to the leaders and to our, our country and our government, local and nationally, stay all that the wisdom would promote peace. We'll promote peace. And lastly, let's pray this, that our wisdom would lead others to saving faith in Jesus. That we would live in such a way that we would walk in godly wisdom that would attract people to us. That would attract people here. And then, let's pray that the Spirit would move in their life and they would become believers and followers of Jesus. This is what we're praying for. Last thing is this, walking in wisdom is believing that Jesus did not die just for your saving, but also for your living. He died that you would be saved, and he died also that you would live in him. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, and we're thankful for you. And Lord, I pray for wisdom. I pray that you would make us wise. I'm Lord, you, your word says that if we ask, you will give it to us generously. Lord, we are praying and we are asking for wisdom. And I pray that when we leave this place at 1219 as a church, that we would pray and that we would pray asking for wisdom. And on Wednesday when we fast, we would fast for wisdom. For, for wisdom. And Lord, I pray that you, would, that you would give that to us. But Lord, also that we would walk in it. That we would pursue holiness. That we would be a people marked by your gospel that we would know that it just it didn't just save us, but Lord, it, it then it is helping us to live our life every day. Lord, I pray that because of that, that we would see people come to know Jesus. That we would see people that would submit their life to the lordship of you and what you've done for them in the gospel. We love you and we praise you. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. We can't ask you all to join together with us this morning in a hymn of invitation. So we are going to sing uh, Blessed Assurance for you. Um, if you'll just hum along with us, listen to the words, sing it in your head or your heart.
Pray with me, please. Our Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do for us. Um, we thank you for this church and this church family, Father. As we go out, we pray for wisdom. We pray that we are um, the, the Christians that you want us to be and others recognize that we are different, Father. We pray for um, the ability to, to um, tell others about you, Father. We just thank you for all that you do. Thank you for um, the righteousness that you, you give us, the holiness that we are pursuing, Father. We just thank you for, for that. Now as we um, dismiss, Father, just guide us, protect us as we go out. And thank you again for all that you are and all that you do. In Christ's name, amen. All right, we're going to dismiss.